the danger of my life, Rave New World by Aldous Huxley. In the year 632 after Ford, a group of students went inside the gray and crowded building of the Incubation and Conditioning Center of Central London. They were guided by its director, a true eminence in the sector. With enthusiasm, they explained the work that was done there. They entered the fertilization lab where 300 fertilizers worked on examining the yellow microscopes. The director proudly explained the modern Volkanovsky method, where an egg and a sperm join the test tube and multiply giving rise to 896 identical embryos. This process was performed paradoxically by stopping normal growth. It was the process of mass production applied to biology. The director addressed Henry Foster, a scientist in the packaging room, in charge of packing and labeling the embryos to send them to the social predestination room. In there, they focused on the quality of thousands of embryos. In order to create socialized human beings with a specific future, their oxygen level was controlled. According to the caste they belonged to, they were provided different amounts of oxygen so that they were more or less intelligent. The Epsilons were the lowest caste and the Alphas the highest. Regardless of their membership, everyone was educated for their social destiny. Then the room ended with tunnels that took the boats. There was Lenina, a beautiful nurse who injected Typhus into the boats to immunize them. Before leaving, Foster agreed to meet her in the afternoon and turned the director's slap Lenina. Sexual freedom was one of the basic principles of this society. In fact, many scientists study to anticipate physical and sexual maturity. The tour continues in the nursery, in the knee Pavlovian conditioning room. They took out several identical children dressed in khaki of the Delta cast. They put them on the floor and placed books with colorful flowers in front of them. The children approached happily and when they were about to grab them, the bright colors paled. Shortly after, they activated a lever that sounded an explosion and a beep of an alarm. The children got scared and burst into tears and terror, then they supplied an electric shock. The screams became insane until they stopped, and everything returned to a normal crying of a child. They were offered again the flowers and books. The children approached. But when they were about to touch it, they turned away and cried again, associating it with the previous sensation. All this was done to instill hatred of nature because it didn't give money, and books since they were dangerous. Then they left the children and headed to a room full of beds. In them around 80 children slept peacefully, while a speaker repeated principles of their past, such as their clothes and their functions. It was a teaching system called Hypnopedia. They performed it 120 times, three times a week for 30 months. Then the group of students headed to the courtyard. It was recess time and the children played naked. While the director told them about the practice of sex games, the auditor appeared. Mr. Fermind. He explained to the young the evils of family and home, monogamy and romanticism, and concluded with the phrase, Everyone belongs to everyone, what they had been taught since childhood. He also talked about Soma, a drug that helped fight aging and bad moods. Meanwhile, in the girls' locker room, Lennon and Crown talked with Fanny about men. Lennon was dating Henry Foster for four months. Fanny thought that was too long without seeing other people. She recommended seeing women to not call attention from above. Vernon Marks, a lonely man who had offered to travel to the reserves for savages, came to her mind. At the same time, Foster talked with a friend about Lennon as if she were an object. This disgusted Vernon Marks who listened to them from behind. Foster and his friend heard him mutter and looked at him mocking him. <laughs> Leaving the locker room, Lennon saw Vernon in the elevator. She confirmed the trip to New Mexico and he responded shyly. Lennon's mannerisms made him nervous, but at the same time he liked her. They reached the roof and said goodbye. When Bernard was alone, a friend offered him a soma to improve his character. But Bernard slipped away without listening. He didn't like people at all. His appearance did not correspond to his alpha cast. He was shorter and squalid like a gamma. The cause of that he felt inferior and was unpleasant with others. Fortunately, shortly after the city flew south towards the propaganda house. When Lennon arrived at the helicopter in which Foster was, he reproached her for her unpunctuality of four minutes. They flew over the city and minutes later they reached their destination to play obstacle golf. Once at the propaganda house, Bernard Mahelm Holtz Watson, a professor at the School of Emotional Engineering. Barkin and Dineja, he was the perfect example of an alpha. According to his superiors, he was too competent. So he had the same obstacles as Bernard with his appearance. They understood them too. After dinner with Watson, Bernard attended his solidarity service. He arrived a little late but was not the last. He sat next to Morgan in. This girl obsessed with having both eyebrows together in one. 
The service consisted of worshipping the greatest being. Everyone was carried away by the sensations of the ceremony, but at the end Bernard felt equally empty. Lennon and Foster returned to London in their helicopter, on the way they talked about the approval of cremation of the bodies. Foster was comforted to know that while he lived in whatever his caste as everyone was happy. This axiom was repeated 150 times every night for 12 years. Then they landed on Foster's roof, had dinner and summer with coffee, and went to the cabaret of Westminster Abbey to dance. After several appointments with Lennon and although they both had difficulty understanding, Vernon began to process the papers for the trip to New Mexico. He asked the principal to sign for consent. After signing, the director told Vernon a hard experience he lived at the land for the savages. He explained that he had made that same trip with a young woman. One night while they were sleeping, it started to rain. When the director woke up, the girl was no longer by his side. A rescue team was organized, but there was no sign of the young woman. Since then, he feels bad and often dreams of her. When the director realized that he had revealed that part of his past to Bernard, he was very ashamed and began to reproach him for his behavior with his colleagues. He threatened to send him to Iceland for service, despite the warning, a sense of rebellion was born in Bernard. Once in New Mexico, the guardian of the place began to explain to Bernard and Lennon what they needed to know about the place. They had nothing to fear from the savages since they were used to seeing tourists. They were also protected by an electrified fence. At the end of the talk, Bernard called Watson to turn off his perfume tap. He took the opportunity to tell his friend that the director had said that he would be sent to Iceland. Bernard's heart stopped. He was so terrified that he accepted Lennon or Soma tablets. Then they got on the roof to leave on the plane. When they arrived, the first time they visited left Lennon horrified. The society, the garbage, the dust, the dogs, the flies, it was almost unpleasant. She needed Soma but had left it at the hotel. She was surprised to see an old man with the features of old age, and it seemed awful to see a mother breastfeeding. Finally, they were taken to a terrace overlooking the town square. There was very loud music, dehumanized figures appeared performing a strange dance. Then they threw some snakes to the center of the square and some hands showed him and nailed to a cross. Then there was a young man who they began to whip. After several laps to the square, the boy fell to the ground. Lenin couldn't stop crying. Suddenly, the whole crowd of the square disappeared. Lenin was still crying when a young man with an Indian tree but Western features came out on the terrace. He felt ashamed because the natives did not admit him to their rituals because of his skin color. The nun in a smiled at him tenderly and he was dumbfounded with her smile. The young man told them that Linda, his mother, Lenina was violent with the word, had arrived from the other place with another man before he was born. On one of her days off, she went for a walk and she fell into a ravine and injured her head. Since then, she never heard from the man who was the boy's father. His name was Tomaskin. Bernard started to think Thomas was the principal's first name. The young man named John took them to his house on the outskirts of town. There he met Linda, a woman who Lennon had found repulsive. However, a woman was happy to see civilized faces. She told Lennon how hard it had been to get used to this society, a society of monogamy and having children. On the other hand, John spoke to Bernard of his childhood. He told him that he had always been rejected by society. But his mother taught him to read and it served as refuge to criticism of other children. One day he found a strange book, the complete works of William Shakespeare, and a new world of feelings opened up. He had felt so alone that John and Bernard bonded on just sharing his loneliness by being different. That night, Bernard came up with a plan to uncover the boy's father, the director. The next day, he left Lennon sleeping to do what he needed. After several calls, he launched his plan, take the two individuals to London. Back in London at the incubation centre, the director entered determined to send Bernard to Iceland for being an enemy of society. However, his wishes were interrupted at the moment Bernard pointed at the door. Then entered Linda with her dirty appearance causing alarm. She approached the director, smiling, calling him to Marquine. She yelled, you gave me a baby. Then there was silence and the director turned pale. John immediately entered and knelt at his feet and called him father. The director left the room running. The gossip ran like wildfire. The director resigned from his post and everyone looked with admiration at the strange savage. However, Linda went completely unnoticed and plunged into Somer's vacation. Bernard began to be treated like a true personality and had all the women he wanted. Needless to say, he was not sent to Iceland. Because of his success, Bernard ditched his friend Watson. The days went by and everyone was in charge of teaching John all the corners of the city. 
the wings, the labs, the entertainment venues. On one of those visits, Jonah asked if they read Shakespeare but only had a resounding no. Lenina liked the savage more and more, but it upset her not to know what he thought. He seemed to be reluctant, but at the same time she often caught him watching her secretly. The truth is that John did like Lenina, but he did not want to get carried away by his selfish feelings and because the guilt of sin haunted him. One night Bernard organized a dinner for those who did not know the savage yet, but John refused to leave his room. When Bernard informed the assembly of this refusal, everyone was enraged and left the room. When he was alone, he began to cry, his fame had plummeted. The next day, he got up and went to work in a very bad mood at the conditioning center. The false friends had disappeared, and his true friends like John and Watson reappeared. However, a feeling of revenge had emerged in Bernard that he wanted to use against his friends since they were the weakest people. Meanwhile, John and Watson became friends. They understood each other perfectly. Watson read his verses and John read Romeo and Juliet, although the first had a hard time understanding the play. Bernard became jealous and took someone to fight it. Lenina was sad. She liked John, and although he seemed to feel the same for her, he acted strangely. One day she found the courage to go to him to declare her feelings. Before she could say anything, John told her he loved her, Lenina was very happy and kissed him. However, he didn't have the same concept of love. John didn't like Lenina's passion and turned violent. Causing Lenina to hide in the bathroom until John received an urgent call and left home. He went to the hospital because Linda was dying. John suffered when he saw his mother like that, but she didn't recognize him. She called him Poppy like her lover. He shook her, but Linda was far from there. Suddenly her face turned blue and she breathed the last breath. John felt a lot of pain and nobody could understand it since they were educated so that death was not painful. Leaving the hospital, he met a crowd that was looking for Soma. His hatred of that world grew by the second. He shouted in silence, then he started recriminating civilization and throwing Soma out the window. Bernard and Watson had been alerted and watched him go out of his mind. Watson offered to help him. Bernard wasn't sure if he wanted to cooperate. In his indecision, the police appeared, shooting Soma in water with pink colors. After a few minutes, everyone was relaxed and under the influence. Then the three detainees were taken to the auditor's office. Watson took it with humor, Bernard was distraught, and John agitated. Mr. Foreman told them about the benefits of civilization. Control and ignorance, since they put it in danger, they were going to send them to an island. Bernard panicked and began to blame his friends. Three workers took him. After a long conversation and once at home, John needed to purify himself. He made a mixture that caused vomiting, Bernard and Watson looked worried. Bernard apologized to John for his behavior, he accepted it. John really wanted to go with them. But they didn't let him because he was subject to experimentation, so John decided to become a hermit to live alone and perform his rituals of penance. Until one day he was discovered by three Delta peasants, the next day he was surrounded by reporters. And after attacking one of them, he was left alone for a while. Every time Lenin appeared in his mind, he whipped himself. One day all his rituals were recorded and the movie was called The Savage of Surrey. This brought thousands of curious people. Over while John saw among many people a familiar smile, Lenina, he went to her and to the surprise of the young woman began to attack her. The crowd shouted excitedly until the show was over and all the helicopters disappeared. The next day more people came, but there was no sign of the savage. They entered the hermitage and in the background they saw feet hanging in circles in the air. 